for that wonderful special choir. God bless you so much. And for the sacrifice you make in the practice time through the week. We appreciate you all. Let's go before the Lord. Mighty God, Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord. We do truly thank you for every day that you allow us. We know it is because of kindness to us and love for us from you. Lord God, we thank you even for the greater gift, and that's for eternal life through Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, also for the forgiveness of sins that Jesus has allowed through the sacrifice on the cross. And Lord, we thank you for each and every sister and brother that's here today. It is the name of Jesus that binds us together in love, as family, in compassion, and care. We pray, Father, that we will be truly a wonderful example for our loved ones, for our friends, for our family, and our community. We pray all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. God is always faithful, and he speaks to us always through his holy word. The, bullet, the notes are on the back of your bulletin. You're welcome to follow along there. Today's message is a continuation from last week. We just um, got through, came through the Easter holiday, and of course we had a message on Palm Sunday, specifically about Palm Sunday. And then we had a message about um, the, the sacrifice of Jesus, and we saw that through the movie on Good Friday service. And then we had a message about Easter on Easter Sunday. Then afterwards, we had a message about what happened, what happened after the resurrection. And now I'd like to continue with one more message about what happened after the resurrection. Because truly, this message brings us to the present day. It takes us through the book of Acts, which is the book right after uh, the four Gospels in the New Testament. So you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that have the record of the life of Jesus, the, the birth, the life, the ministry, the death and resurrection of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then the book of Acts has everything after, starting the church, the sacrifice of the disciples, in the starting of the ministry and evangelism. So that's what we're going to talk about today and bring us into today's um, generation, basically. I'd like to start with the word evangelism, because really that's where evangelism starts in the book of Acts. And I'd like to define that for us. Evangelism, the spreading of the Christian gospel by public preaching or personal witness. So there's two very beautiful ways of sharing the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. And, and one is by public preaching, and the other is through personal witness. Now, personal witness could actually be a way where you're witnessing to people. You, you are telling them about Jesus, not even using words. It's your day-to-day -day life when they see you consistently. And also in your a family where you are a loving person and a peaceful person and they see that in your lifestyle where you are truly a godly person and as a neighbor okay and uh, also in personal witness where you verbally give a testimony of what Jesus has done for you how Jesus has changed your life or how Jesus has answered a prayer okay so there's multiple ways of evangelism I'd like to tell you about tools for evangelism. Now, we have Living Waters Ministry is one beautiful way that we can understand what evangelism is. And I'd like to, in just one moment, show the video for you. And through that same ministry, Living Waters Ministry, you'll, you can find something called the Evidence Bible, where if you're ever trying to talk to a person who's an atheist, or talk to a person who doesn't believe in God, or talks to a person who has a lot of questions, the Evidence Bible is a collection from the creator of Living Waters, Living Waters Ministry, where he has already answered all these questions scripturally and scientifically, where you can read and build your knowledge, and build your defense, and give you an answer for people when they have a question. 
and another book, The School of Biblical Evangelism Textbook, a beautiful book also that's written by the same author. I'd like to give you an example of evangelism today. The, the disciples started evangelism in the book of Acts. It continued through the rest of the Word of God, and it continued for generations all the way to present day today. Because truly, we're still talking about Jesus. We're still talking about what He has done for us. We're still talking about the saving knowledge. And every generation has tasted God and knows that God is good. And I'd like to share this video with you now. And there's many more videos like this. When you pull up this video, let's say, for example, you can see many more examples like this. Touching, tasting, or smelling? Smelling. You know, when you give up your smelling, you give up your taste. You know that? You can't, oh, yeah. You, yeah. You can't taste any food if you give up the smell. Yeah, I think I still would rather still get that up, though, because I, you know, sight, seeing, I'd rather see more than I guess taste. It's pretty tough, but I'll stay with the uh, first one. You value your eyes? I do. Now, where did your eyes come from? Who made your eyes? Oh, wow, that's a good question. I would say God. I would, I would think. <laughs> it's pretty hard to make. There's 137 million light sensitive cells in each eye. Oh, wow. The focusing muscles move 100,000 times a day. That's what they estimate. So the eyes are very intricate. So you believe in God's existence? I do. What's going to happen to you when you die? Where are you going, Harold? Hopefully heaven. Hopefully? Uh, hopefully heaven, if there is one. <laughs> do you think hell exists? I do. Are you going there? No. <laughs> you wouldn't want to go there, would you? Not at all. <laughs> if you were heading there, would you like someone to tell you so you could change things? I would. Do you think you're a good person? Are you going to make it to heaven? Yes, I think I'm a good person. Now. How many lies have you told in your life? Oh, wow. Mm, I can't count on one or two hands. <laughs> I, to be honest, a lot. Have you ever stolen something? Uh, not in a long time, but yes. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Uh, yes. Do you realize what you're doing when you do that? You're using God's name as a cuss word when Jesus said, Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. It's holy. Godly Jews won't even speak God's name. It's so holy. But you've used it to cuss in place of a four-letter filth word. The one that gave you your eyes and your life. It's very serious to use God's name in blasphemy. Now Jesus said, if you look at a woman and lust for her, you commit adultery with her in your heart. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Yes. So, Harold, I'm not judging you, but you've just told me you're a lying thief, a blasphemer, and an adulterer heart. <laughs> so if God judges you by the Ten Commandments, on the day of judgment, I'm going to look before, you're going to be innocent or guilty? Uh, I would be guilty. I'd like to repent. Heaven or hell? Uh, heaven. Now, why would you be going to heaven when you've broken the commandments? Uh, because I think by the time I do go, you know, whichever place I end up going at, you know, I'll be the repentant by the end, and, you know, I know he, gives, he forgives all. You know, the Bible says repentance can't save you, and you know why? Oh, wow, I don't. Well, you just look in a court of law, and let's say you've committed very serious crimes, like you've robbed a bank and you shot a guard on the way out, and the judge says you're guilty, and you say, yes, judge, I am guilty, but I'm really sorry, and I won't do it again. He's not going to let you go. He's going to say you should be sorry, and of course you shouldn't do it again. And he's going to throw you in prison for breaking the law. And exactly the same applies to God. We should be sorry for our sins, and of course we shouldn't do it again. So repentance can't save us. You need something else to save you from hell. You know, the Bible says all liars are their part in the lake of fire. That's how serious sin is to God. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. We trivialize sins. That's a white lie. Everyone tells lies. But no thief will inherit God's king. No blasphemer, no adulterer. So you're in big trouble on Judgment Day. Can you see that? Yeah, I can. <laughs> How did you put it that way? Now, do you know what God did so guilty sinners wouldn't have to go to hell? Yeah, he gave his life up for us. He came to balance the scales. He came to justify us or make it as though we'd never sinned. And this is how he did it. God became a human being, suffered and died on the cross, which you know, but you may not know this aspect. You and I broke God's law, the moral law, the Ten Commandments called the moral law. Jesus came and paid the fine. 
If you're in court and someone pays the fine, the judge can legally let you go. He can say, hey, I was guilty, he committed the crime, but someone's paid his fine, he's out of here, and he can let you go, because another paid your fine. When Jesus was on the cross, just before he died, he said a very strange thing. He said, it is finished. In other words, the debt has been paid. That means God can dismiss your case, forgive your sins, commute your death sentence, let you live forever because of the substitutionary suffering death of the Messiah. But what you have to do in response to his death and resurrection is repent of your sins, yes, but trust in Jesus. That's the saving power when you trust in Christ. It's like turning to a parachute because you need it won't save you, but putting it on, putting your faith in the parachute, trusting it, will save you. Can you see the difference? Yes, okay. And a lot of people believe in Jesus, like they believe in a parachute, but they've never repented and trusted in him entirely. Now, at the moment, in trusting in your goodness to save you, you're like a man who's going to jump out of a plane 10,000 feet, and he thinks, I'm going to save myself by flapping my arms. It's not going to work. You're not going to save yourself because you're not a good person. You've got to trust entirely in Jesus, as Lord and Savior. The minute you do that, Harold, God will forgive your sins in an instant because he's rich in mercy. And he will grant you the gift of everlasting life. Most people, literally billions around the world, are trying to earn eternal life by being religious. And what they don't realize is that God to judge, that criminal is in his eyes, and anything they offer judge is an attempt to bribe him. Say, judge, I'll do this. I'll lie in beds and nails, sit on half pews, face mega, fast, pray, do religious works, and you give in exchange everlasting life. And God's not going to do it because they'll not be bribed. He's not a corrupt judge. The only thing that can save us is his mercy. And that's what he extends to us in Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? It does, a lot. So, Harold, if you were to die today and God gave you justice, you'd end up in hell. There are two things you have to do to be saved. You must repent and trust the Lord in Jesus. When are you going to do that? Immediately. <laughs> can I pray with you? Yes, you can, without a doubt. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, I pray for Harold. Thank you for his open heart. And his tender conscience and his acknowledging of his own sins, and I pray he'll see your love expressed in the cross, and today truly and sorrowfully repent of all sin and trust alone in Jesus, and pass from death to life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, great to talk to you, Harold. I've got something I want to give you. Okay, no problem. I'll take it. so much. If you'd like to see more videos like that, Living Waters Ministry. And this was a very successful uh, interview that uh, Ray had with this person. And uh, there's many other kinds of um, interviews that were more challenging and were more uh, defiant. Uh, Ray has been up against Satanists, atheists, uh, people full of hate, people full of sorrow, depression, and on and on. And to see how he asked them questions, to see how he brought in conversation the need of a Savior is just amazing. And that's what brings us to apologetics. That's the next part of uh, what we see in the book of Acts, what we see the disciples did, but it wasn't given by definition of the word of apologetics, but you can see the action of apologetics, and we have given it a definition. And here's what the definition is. Defense for Christian beliefs against objections. When we first started seeing apologetics in the Bible, in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, we see the disciples when they were talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they were telling them about how Jesus is the Messiah. And here's why Jesus is the Messiah. And, and the disciples would show the Pharisees and the Sadducees, look, here's uh, the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled, and on and on. And then they went to many other people. They went to the Gentiles, the people who didn't know the Bible, the people who didn't know the prophecies of the Messiah, and then they showed them the need of a Savior. And look at the kind of questions that apologetics answers. <clears throat> For example, why believe in God? Believe it or not, even in our day and age, 
even how God has clearly revealed himself by the miraculous nature that we are able to appreciate and enjoy. The miracle of life, the miracle of our own human body, how Ray talked about the eye. The eye itself is a miracle. And how uh, the birth of a child is a miracle, the gift of life. And we look at the design of all the different variety of birds and all the different variety of insects and all these different things. See, evolution doesn't have order. Evolution doesn't have design. Evolution doesn't think of beauty. A creator thinks of all these different things. And so there are people in this world that just haven't taken the time to even think or even have the consideration or maybe they're living a lifestyle that's in such rebellion to God. That's why. That's why they don't even think about who God is or what God is or what God wants from us. Another question that apologetics answers, why is Jesus the only way to heaven? Uh, there are many people out there that believe any way you choose, any kind of life you live, any kind of lifestyle you want, it'll get you to heaven. Don't worry about it. Well, sorry, uh, apologetics will give an answer why that's not correct. And of course, we, we, when we say this, we're talking about speaking with gentleness and respect. And that's if a person wants to give and take. But if a person doesn't want to hear, that's okay too. The, the Word of God says, shake off your sandals and go to the next person, right? Of course, we don't have that many sandals around these days, but back in the day, that's what they wore all the time. But the idea was, just go on to the next person. If a person isn't welcoming, if a person doesn't want to hear you, that's okay. We're not fighting to give the Word of God, to give an invitation to be saved. We are, out of love, out of concern, we do this. Another question is this. Why do I need to go to church? Believe it or not, church is a blessing. Believe it or not, there are people in other countries that are forbidden to have churches. That are forbidden to even come together like this, freely and openly and sing praises to God. So, uh, this is a question that people have. And we can answer that through the Word of God. One thing as well, what we see that evangelism brings is this. Angry mobs, persecution, and I wrote angry mobs again, but why? Why does evangelism bring angry mobs and persecution? When we look at the Word of God and we see the disciples out of love for their fellow human being, out of kindness, out of compassion, there were some who truly thanked the disciples for coming and sharing the good news. And we see that through the generations where there were people, missionaries, welcomed and respected and honored for sharing the good news of salvation, how to get to heaven. But we also see many hardships and people who became angry, people who threatened the lives of these missionaries and evangelists. And there were times when these people were stoned. There were times when, people, when these people were imprisoned and even faced worse, uglier deaths that, that we could go into another time. But truly, if I told you some of the deaths that these 11 disciples saw or other missionaries saw, you'd be like, wow, you know, what a sacrifice it is to follow Jesus. The, the word, the, in the book of Acts, it records the events and the establishing of the bride of Christ. When we see that the disciples worked so hard in faithfulness to God to establish the Bride of Christ, they went through many hardships. And what's the Bride of Christ? It is the church. And the church is very precious. And it's not the building we're talking about. It is all the believers. The believers make up the Bride of Christ. And so Jesus is called the groom. Jesus is the groom. And the church, the Christian church, the holy church, that is the Bride of Christ. So what brought about 
the angry mobs, and the persecution. I have four points here for you. Jesus brought a sword to this earth. Now we think of Jesus as the gentle shepherd, the good shepherd. But why did Jesus bring a sword? He himself said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. But yet, he was always talking about peace. He always talked about forgiveness. He always talked about mercy. So what's the sword that he talked about? It's truth. Truth. Truth, if a person doesn't want it, will make anger. Will make a person maybe not like you, make a person actually maybe upset with you. When you speak truth, even gently, even respectfully, truth, if a person doesn't want to accept it, will bring about a very negative response. And that's what the Word of God is. The Word of God is truth. It's the Holy Word of God. That's the Holy Truth. And that's why you'll get a spiritual response, a dark response, an evil response, when you give truth to people in love and gentleness and respect. Jesus brought light into darkness. And we spoke of that before because the light pierces the darkness. And, and I made an additional note here. We cannot remain in our sins and expect to go to heaven. Time and time again, when uh, we see evangelism occur, and if you are, take the time on YouTube to watch some of the examples of these different visits that Ray did with, with people all over America, uh, you'll find that there are many people who are living a mediocre lifestyle in regards to, uh, they believe in God, they believe that, that they're good enough to get into heaven, and that it's okay to live however they want. But very clearly, the Word of God tells us that's not correct. Well, number one, the only way you can get to heaven is by accepting Jesus as Savior. But it doesn't stop there. After that, you have to repent of your way of life, your way of living, your way of thinking, and follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. You become a disciple of Jesus. So you start living the way he approves of. That's what makes you a follower of Jesus. And sacrificing from what you think is right and start following what he says is right and true. Okay? So that's what, that's what light is doing to darkness. It is making the darkness flee, bringing purity, bringing holiness, bringing godliness into the room. And again, we cannot remain in our sins and expect to go to heaven. Jesus brought salvation for the lost. Believe it or not, the Pharisees and Sadducees and many other people who were lost hated the disciples, hated missionaries, hated evangelists for bringing the good news. But why would they do that? Because people wanted to re remain in darkness. They wanted to remain in ignorance. They wanted to remain in the life that they were living. Very often, they knew it. They knew it meant giving up their way of life, their beliefs, their standards to follow the Lord. And they were convicted. And that's why they hated the truth and hated the good news and hated the gospel of Jesus. And the fourth point, Jesus revealed the only road to heaven. There is a false doctrine that's being taught today by even many celebrities that are out there that have a lot of prestige. That whatever you believe is okay. It's all good. You're going to get to heaven. Just by following whatever road you want. You're welcome to do whatever you want. You're welcome to choose whatever you want. God loves you so much, He gave you freedom. He gave you freedom of choice. He gave every human being freedom of choice. But He did also give us the truth. And he made it very clear that the only way you get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. That's the only way. There's only one name we can call on to be saved, and that's the Lord Jesus. There's only one that has paid our debt, our wages, and that's Jesus. All right? Um, and in closing today, you know, I, I use this very often, this quote I'm closing with, 
for pastors, when pastors go up against difficult congregants. <laughs> but I use this also for us today, because all of you are people of God. All of you are evangelists. All of you are ministers. All of you are ambassadors of Jesus. So when you have the gospel of Jesus in your life, and you're living it, and you're wanting to live the holy lifestyle, the godly lifestyle, the way that the Lord approves of, right? Uh, you're going to find, wow, it's not so easy. I mean, people you know, should love me because I'm living this wonderful, godly lifestyle. And all of a sudden, you find people not like you, and you're doing good, and you're shocked. Why is that? Well, what, your lifestyle might very well convict them. Your, the spirit within you, when the Holy Spirit of God dwells within the Christian, that in itself, that presence, convicts people. And so the quote is this. If you want everyone to love you, don't be a Christian, go sell ice cream. <laughs> you know, if you sold ice cream, I tell you, you look at the line of people who, who go to buy ice cream, they're all smiling. I mean, this is the greatest thing. They love it. They're, they're, they love what they're going to get. And after they get their ice cream, they're smiling. That's like one of the happiest moments of the day, right? Or, or the week. Maybe it's the sugar or what, I don't know what it is. But it puts a smile on people's faces, right? Or maybe it brings back memories of your childhood. I'm not sure what it is. But it might very well be a, um, a health reaction or a... Or a uh, uh, science reaction, the sugar in your system makes you smile. But that's not the Christian life. Unfortunately, unfortunately. We live in a fallen world, and to follow Jesus means we sacrifice from the things that this fallen world chooses to do and chooses to live by. And to follow Jesus means we follow a higher holy standard. We follow him. And people get convicted by your life. And if you share the good news of Jesus, even though it's because you love them and you want to see them in heaven, only the wise people, only the people who are searching for God, only the people who want to go to heaven are going to love you for that good news. But the other people, they very well could hate you for delivering good news to them. Out of care. Out of love. So just be warned and be encouraged. Do right by God. Be bold. And God will reward you. And be prayerful. You know, sometimes they're not going to turn their life around right away. Or, or respond right away. But in kindness, in love, in consistency, in prayer, by a, a real living Christian testimony, day in and day out, a person can, can be very well blessed by your life, and their spiritual eyes that are blind could very well be opened and understand why you say what you say and do what you do and, and why you are excited about Jesus, one day they may, they may very well have eyes to see and a heart to receive. So you be that consistent Christian. You know, we look back through the Word of God, even as far back in the Old Testament, and we still see Christians, believers in God, that made sacrifices. And they made a line in the sand we look at Joshua, the leader of Israel after Moses. And Joshua told the people, look, you have the choice. You could worship the false gods that you learned about when we were slaves in Egypt. Or you can follow the living God. But here's a, here's a line in the sand, people. As for me... In my family, we're going to worship the Lord, the living God, the only one. And so for you, make that line in the sand where people know who you are, what you stand for, and 
be that light on the hill, be the salt of the earth. And if you're hated for it, you know, don't take it negatively. It's not you that they hate. It's the sin in their life or their, uh, their desire of not giving up and surrendering to Jesus. So you be that loving person and understand that they're having a struggle, a spiritual struggle within them. Pray for them because the devil doesn't want to let them go. Mm -hmm. But God is great and God can lift that veil. Amen. Mm -hmm. Let's go before the Lord. Mighty God, Heavenly Father, we love you. And Lord God, we know that you want good for us. And we know, Lord, that by us accepting your truth, the good news of Jesus, the message of salvation, that truly we will start living an abundant life, a good life, a life of peace, a life that isn't uh, tainted with guilt or darkness. And Lord, we want to be the people who are uh, a good example and a blessing for ourselves, for our family, for our kids, for our neighbors. Lord, give us this hunger and thirst for righteousness. Give us, Lord, this heart of discipline and self-control. Give us, Lord, a desire to continue searching your holy word and being blessed by it daily. Lord God, give us this ability, this strength, to be able to go to your holy word every day and take nutrition from it for our Christian life so we can continue living a life that makes you happy and that, that is a blessing for everyone. And Lord, thank you for opening our eyes that we can see what's right, what's wrong, what's the way of salvation. And Lord, for those people who we love, who we care about, who are lost, who are in darkness, give us wisdom how to talk to them. Give us, Lord, a heart of compassion where we don't give up on them. And give us, Lord, leading by your Holy Spirit of when and how and where to talk to them. And remind us, Lord, of the Scriptures. Remind us, Lord, of your Holy Word, where when we talk to them and they have questions, we'll be able to give a wonderful example, a wonderful ex response to any of the questions that they have. We pray all of this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.